Oftentimes when we talk about scientific equipment, we tend to talk about the old style versions and we don't really bring up the new versions. And there's usually a good reason for that. If we talk about the old style instead of the digital versions, we can really get across some key elements of what's going on inside of a particular apparatus. And that's going to be especially true when we talk about a barometer. Now the barometer, the old way of setting up one of these was to take a really tall test tube shaped object. And it's going to be about a meter tall. And we're going to fill it to the very brim with mercury. And keep in mind, mercury is the only metal that we have that's liquid at room temperature. But we also know a couple of other things about that. One is that when you heat a mercury thermometer, the mercury expands. And that's how you were able to see what the temperature was. We don't use mercury thermometers much anymore either. But that was one important consideration with mercury. It changes its density and volume dramatically with temperature. The other consideration we have is, well, mercury is not very safe to work with. If you have a lot of mercury in your laboratory or in your life, you're probably going to have some very creative and problematic diseases that result as a response to that. And so we do our best to not use mercury whenever possible. But let's just say for the sake of argument that we are going to use mercury to build a barometer, the old school version. We're going to go ahead and cover up this surface so that we can flip it upside down really quickly. We'll just pull off our little cover and we'll immerse it in some mercury. Now here's the thing. You see that it's filled with what looks like air here? It's not going to be air at all. We didn't let any air bubbles get in here. That's why we quickly inverted it while being covered. It's listed here as being a vacuum. I think it's better for us to say that there are some isolated atoms of mercury that have ended up being a vapor. And if we were to actually put a wire into the mercury down here and we had embedded a wire into the glass, we'd actually be able to make it glow. That's basically how a mercury light bulb is built. Um, we're not going to do that, but it does emphasize that while it's listed here as a vacuum, it's a low pressure region filled with only mercury vapor and a very small amount of mercury vapor at that. Now whether that fits our definition of what we'll call a vacuum or not just depends on how rigorous we're being in the term vacuum and how hardcore we are. But we'll go with that definition for now. We'll say that it's a vacuum or at least a really low pressure of mercury vapor. Now it's a metal and that means that it's going to be sticking to other metal atoms very tightly, right? It's going to have metallic bonding forces holding them together. And so they're going to stay mostly attached down here in our mercury column. Only a few isolated atoms will be floating around here in the vapor phase. Close enough for the definition of vacuum, right? Now, if we're picturing what's happening here, one of the reasons that it was able to draw such a small vapor pressure is that we have very few atoms there, sure, but the other part of it is think of how much weight, or better to say mass, of mercury is going to be pulling downward on that column. That's a big chunk of metal pulling straight downward, and since the liquid, it can really pull and warp itself as needed to fill the container and squish its way down, right? Now, as a result, we're going to have a fairly consistent amount of vapor form up here based on the weight of mercury that's hanging down below. And if we make little markings, and originally what they did is they set it up with a meter stick and each of these markings is one millimeter apart, millimeters of mercury. It tells us how many millimeters of mercury tall the column of mercury could be supported over top of this dish. And that height was 760 millimeters of mercury. Now if we wanted to build a barometer with water, we could do that. Uh, and instead of it being millimeters mercury, we'd have to describe it as millimeters H2O. And it would be a much taller column that was needed, that's for sure, um, but we'll leave that one alone for now. Now, if the pressure out here starts to fluctuate though, what's going to end up happening is you can picture that we're sitting at the bottom of an ocean of gas. The stack of oxygen, or of air really, most of it being nitrogen, the stack of that sitting over top of our heads is actually really, really heavy. We just don't notice that we're swimming at the bottom of this dense ocean of gas because we've lived all of our lives here, right? Now, a, meter, a square meter is going to have a really heavy column of air sitting on top of it. Notice that's going to be four zeros uh, after that, so we'll be at 10,000 kilograms, so about 10 tons of air stacked over each square meter. You've got a lot of air sitting on your head right now. 
Well, all that pressure is going to be pushing downward on this mercury. And so there's a balance of forces at play. As all this is pushing down on it, it's forcing some of the mercury back up. Meanwhile, this vacuum is helping to support some of that as well. If you increase the amount of pressure, well, it's going to push that mercury up, right? And we're going to see it as a higher pressure. If we have a vacuum down here where it's a tiny amount of pressure, then it's not going to be suspended as well, and we'll show it as a lower column of mercury. And that means it's going to show up as a lower pressure. And so the pressure unit that we see is going to be less. Now, that typical sea level, you know, zero, at, uh, zero uh, meters above sea level uh, spot is going to be about 760 millimeters of mercury tall. So that's going to be our typical atmospheric pressure. We're going to have lots of other effects that entangle in there. Now, on top of that, though, let me point out some of the weaknesses of using a mercury barometer. Well, I mentioned temperature a minute ago. We know that it can be set up as a thermometer, so you can stick the thing under your tongue and see what the temperature is. Well, that means the density of this is changing based on how, how what temperature it is, and so we're going to have some real differences in how high that stack of mercury is. As a result, there's that sort of a problem. Uh, and so most of the time we won't use mercury anymore. Um, the hazards, the inconsistency, all of these things are reasons for it. But it's a great example of why we call our typical atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere 760 millimeters of mercury. That's the origin of that particular unit. Now, if we went up to a higher elevation, suppose we're at the top of Mount Everest, we'd actually see that we're only going to be able to support 270 millimeters of mercury in that column because so little air pressure is pushing on the outside, and as a result, the mercury has drooped down further.